Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Moonlight, and I would like to share with you tonight what I have learned about the principle of correspondence, as above, so below. To start with, uh, I, am, I am going to share with you what I've learned through my research on this subject. I've always wondered how, as above, so below, what is behind those words and how does it work? And I am sure most of you know more about it than me. And I would love to invite you to share some thoughts on this uh, with the whole group tonight. I would really appreciate your support in doing that. So um, what, I, what I have found out is that the principle of as above, so below has been present with us since ancient Egypt. And uh, there are uh, documentary uh, mentions um, of it in what is called the Emerald Tablet. And I put here a picture of it and a translation, more or less a translation from 1928. There are earlier translations um, and they all have the flavor of the time when they were made. And um, it is very interesting reading. The Emerald Tablet has been used by alchemists throughout the Middle Ages and um, who have interpreted its meaning uh, in their own quest for uh, the Philosopher's Stone, for immortality, for making gold out of lead and many other things, as all of you um, know, I'm sure. So this is a translation of the tablet and um, versions of the tablet are documented in circulation from the year 200. It was the Arabs who actually perpetuated the, the knowledge of ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. And um, it came to us through them and um, it is attributed, the knowledge here is attributed to, to Hermes, the three times blessed, trim, Trimagestus. And, um, and he is also, you know, as you know, he is a god from the Greek pantheon, who later was adopted by the Romans. <clears throat> and he is also, he was identified in the Roman Empire with Thoth, who is the god of moon and magic in the Egyptian pantheon. So this knowledge apparently uh, comes to us from them. And uh, later on, occultists from the 19th century uh, perpetuated the knowledge uh, that was used by alchemists, and one of them actually put together a very interesting writing. He does not um, say he's the writer, but it is attributed to him. And you can read it. Um, it's called The Kibalion, is a book, and it is, <clears throat> these are a few of, a few different versions of it, uh, interpretations, the Kibalion, a study of the hermetic philosophy of ancient Egypt and Greece. And the Kibalion uses the knowledge of the Emerald Tablet and actually adds, um, adds many layers to it and discusses in detail the how of um, of the um, correspondence, the principle of correspondence, how the, the mechanics of it, if you will. And um, first of all, the writer is saying that the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. 
in other words, this knowledge is to be shared with, uh, with people who are sworn to secrecy, uh, who are um, part of the inner, inner crowd. Um, and today when information is very widely available, it has become a book on the shelf and we can all read it. So according to the Kibalion, there are seven principles of hermetic philosophy and they are the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus. And these principles um, are according to, to the, the author, they are the basis of occultism. The first principle is the principle of mentalism, meaning all is mind. The material universe, the phenomena of life, everything around us are live in our mind and in the mind of the almighty. The second principle is the principle of correspondence, which we are discussing tonight in more detail. And the principle says that as below, as above, so below, as below, so above. There's always a correspondence between the laws and phenomena of the different planes of being and life. And what are these planes? I'm, I'm going to share with you what I learned from the book. Um, and further in the book, in the, in the following chapters, um, we learn about the principle of vibration, which basically states that everything in, in the universe vibrates, everything is energy and it vibrates at different frequencies. The higher the frequency level of the vibration, the more spirit there is um, in that particular um, incarnation, if you will. The next would be the principle of polarity, being that everything is dual, light and dark, yes and no. Um, everything has its pair, everything is a pair of opposites. And all truths are but half truths and all paradoxes may be reconciled. The fifth principle is the principle of rhythm. Everything flows in and out. Everything has its tides. Everything is like a pendulum. All things rise and fall. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. The sixth principle is the principle of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect, what we call karma, perhaps. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. And the seventh principle is the principle of gender which says that everything has its masculine and feminine sides. Uh, according to this principle, no creation, physical, mental, or spiritual is possible without the principle of gender. Women have their masculine side, men have their feminine side, and so forth. So, that being said, um, I'd like to share with you a, a few more details about the planes of, of uh, correspondence, which are mentioned in uh, the Kibalion. The first one would be the great physical plane. The second is called the great mental plane. The third is called the third, the, I'm sorry, the great spiritual plane. The three great planes are three groups of degrees of life manifestation. 
the best measurement scale for the planes of existence is their energetic vibration. The higher the vibration, the higher you are in the layer cake of the great planes. So would you like to, to share uh, some of what you know about um, the second uh, principle, the principle of correspondence before we move along? Because this is going to be more like a technical description. And I'd love to hear from you. So if someone wants to chime in, just unmute yourself and express your thoughts and then we'll move forward. As above, so below. Apparently it has come to us from through this channel. Okay, well, all right, well, so going back to, um, going back to the physical plane. The physical plane is uh, also, according to the author of the Kibalion, is also broken down into different planes, depending on the energetic vibration of the entity, okay, and it goes all the way from um, matter, you know, the elements, earth, water, wind, and fire. It goes to radioactive substances, is a higher layer, higher vibration. The ether, which um, the author believes it pervades the universe, acting as a medium of transmission of energy. The higher plane would be heat, light, magnetism, electricity, and attraction. What, what we say, what we think, we attract, attract the like. The next plane would be higher forms of energy called nature's finer forces, uh, which are manifestations of certain forms of mental phenomena. A higher level would be a highly organized energy best described as life energy available for use on beings of the spiritual plane and can be considered as divine power. Those beings employing this energy are as gods in human eyes. And the higher, um, the higher uh, plane, the mental plane, consists of energy of living beings. And here, the occultists consider that everything is alive, including rocks. Okay, the lowest, the lowest level here would be the mind and soul of rocks followed by plants, and then elementals, which are between plants and animals, then the plane of animal mind and soul, followed by the plane of human mind. And ab above us starts the spiritual plane, which comprises beings whose existence transcends ours so much they are sometimes beyond our comprehension. This is the plane of angels, masters, and adepts, archangels, and demigods. <clears throat> Their planes are below that of the plane of the absolute spirit. And this is why the author says that the stirring of selfish power on the spiritual planes results in the selfish soul losing its balance and falling back as far as it has previously risen. The principle of correspondence manifests in all of these planes 
because there is a correspondence, harmony, and agreement between the several planes of manifestation. This principle is used to change thought into form. As in heaven, so it is on earth. The invisible and visible are all manifestations of the divine. Everything is one. We are God or the goddess or the almighty and God or the goddess is us. And the material world is an extension, an expression of the physical one. This is how astrology influences our daily life. By focusing upward, you send your thoughts into the spiritual realm. The change you desire occurs on the spiritual plane first, before it can settle into the material one where you are. As above, so below. What we think, we create. What we think, we bring into our lives. So mote it be. So mote it be. Moonlight, if I, I, I could, I have a comment. Sure, um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, as you were speaking, I was imagining um, a, pier a pyramid of the chakra colors all the way up to the point on the top. And I mean, we use correspondences every day. We know that rocks vibrate. We have crystals in our house. We know that plants are on a, 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 the next level up because we use herbs in our potions and our medicines and on and on and on. And uh, as we go up to the top of the pyramid and our vibrations become higher and higher at the tippy tippy top, we can reach for those stars, but if we ever lose that vibration, we go right down to the root again and have to start with the primal, the, our primal desires and then work our way back up again. Orange is happy and yellow is intelligence and you know, all the way back up to the goddess. It's, yes. we're always somewhere on that pyramid going up and down, as above, so below. And we go up and down like that. <laughs> That's what I was picturing when you were talking. I have a comment too. Um, basically everything you're saying here also resonates with the beliefs of the reclaiming tradition and with the theory of animism that you know everything has a soul, everything has a purpose, everything is alive. Um, so it's very interesting to look at it in this way also. Yes, that it came to us today in the in our movement from uh, people who are thinking about this uh, two hundred years ago. Yes. yes, exactly. Right. When was another period that was very rich in um, spiritualism? So this is my last slide for tonight, and I chose I chose a tarot card to show to share with you. Is the magician. And I think this card embodies very well the principle of correspondence because the magician with, with his or her magic makes, makes it come true. And if you would care to join, I would like to share with you um, uh, a meditation that I found in one of my favorite books, Silver Raven Wolf, Solitary Witch. And um, it is a meditation where she uh, is teaching us to work on a problem, maybe a relationship that we would, might, we would like to make better, to improve by using the principle of correspondence. So if you will, if you have any any questions about uh, the presentation before we move on to uh, the second part of uh, of tonight, please. I guess um, I have a comment more than a question. Um, 
when you're talking about, you know, like the vibrations and the different levels of them, what I was remembering and thinking of is um, when I do magic work on the violin, the lowest string always corresponds with the earth. And then as you go up, each of them go up by an eighth as you raise the strings from G, D, A, E, and you get different energies and different vibrations from each one. That's another court, just a thought I had. Music does this too. Yes, I totally agree to you. I, I agree with you whenever there's drumming and uh, and I, I listen or I dance, I always experience it that way as well, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I feel that certain, uh, depending on, on how high the drum sounds are, it, it, it's different elements. Mm -hmm. Debbie, you had something? Um, just that uh, different cultures might have, uh, call it something different but uh, especially the older cultures, um, I'm thinking of uh, in particular the, the Japanese, Chinese, they believed in balance in everything and, and that um, uh, yeah, it, it, you can't affect one thing without affecting the opposite and that you need, and then it also gives you that lesson in that you're, uh, you know, one thing may get you so far this way, but now you, there's a repercussion for saying that or doing whatever it is. Um, uh, and as far as, um, like in Japanese, the, the Reiki healing is all about the vibration and um, and you yourself focusing on what you're doing and not that you're doing anything to that person per se but you are encouraging you know uh, the balance again and that's what basically the you know, Reiki is trying to you know help the people find their balance so interesting different cultures what they do i'd like to say something um it seems to me that more um ancient cultures and ancient religions had a had a better understanding of that concept of as above so below um and when we get when religions have gotten off track with that, um, they become imbalanced themselves in how they are enacted in the daily lives of the followers of those particular religions. And um, I think it's interesting that you see like I'm I really mostly practice like Celtic um, because. I'm pretty much a Celtic. <laughs> I'm about as English as you can get. Um, and the, that path in it, the, the fairy path, is very much about understanding that the that veil between the worlds, there's reflections on either side of what's going on, that shimmering in the middle, which is, you know, walking the path of doing the right thing for you and everybody else, making choices that are going to keep you from uh, falling off and maybe not achieving what your true potential is because you get distracted by out of whack energy, right? Because you're not focusing on um, where you're supposed to be headed. So I think it's very interesting how we all, I don't know, it seems like everybody here said from their different perspective and their traditions who has spoken that it's pretty much the same. It's like that concept of, of energy and keeping it, you know, if 
we keep climbing up the ladder as Alba was saying. And like when we mess up somewhere along that way, we get back down to square one, <laughs> starting at earth. And I'm an earth girl, you know, I'm a gardener. So for me, that's a very comfortable place, but there's different vibrations, even of that earth energy that can be for your advantage or not especially in a world that does not appreciate the spiritual but is very kind of focused and and feet concreted pretty much into the real world not really paying attention to that reflection of themselves on the higher on the higher realm mm -hmm. but for me correspondences are earth air fire water and spirit and and it's very interesting diana to hear all of the different other ways that that other more um you know me i hate rules but i know that the uh <laughs> the folks that wrote the emerald tablet like their rules and regulations and it it's interesting to see how it's how it's done in that specific way and how no matter what it still connects with with both whether you're a wild child like myself or you like your rules and regulations that's all it's yes, it's a, the Kibalian is more, is a more kind of like scientific um, breakdown of, of, all, of all this, yes. It's very scholarly. It very is scholarly. Very scholarly. Oh, my. <laughs> it's, I'm reminded of, how should we say this? Among classical cult practices, you have the what's known as high magic and low magic, not necessarily one being better than the other in that sense, but in old school occult terminology, high magic would be defined as one of these things like um, very, very written down, sci not scientific, but very much ceremonial, like big time. And you know, you, you, this is uh, an, a, a, door, a way to open doors into say like the Golden Dawn or um, Salema or something like that, of that nature where it would be very ceremonially based. It would be written down exactly like you have it and you'd find all different kinds of ways. And this is like the modern version considering the ancient occultic way of doing a lot of the ceremonial stuff is like, you know, you, they, they have everything written down in old tombs, um, the, 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 the holy books of, of Moses and Solomon and whatnot. And they would, they, they would plan for like months in advance and specific moon phases and planetary alignments. And it was just, yeah, very much, um, and this is where you'd find a lot of um, priests, like from Christian churches and stuff, they would be practicing side by side because it was seen more as a, a magical practice per se. And, and so therein lies the difference. It would be the, the low magic aspect would be um, what would be known as folk magic. It'd be another way. They would be um, the wise people. They would, they would have principles in that same sense but it, it it would be a lot less rigid should we say more so, feeling than yeah uh, yeah so calculating but yeah. you know they didn't have sky finder on their phones right so <laughs> there was a lot of math involved in the those ceremonial magicians oh where, yeah big time. where the hedge witch would just throw the basil in the pot and that was you know, mm -hmm. her as above, so below. Exactly. It, it would certainly be a case of following the cycles of the year and the earth as opposed to, say, everything, planetary alignments and moon. It was just, it. You know, as Dragonfly was talking and I, my, my uh, picture of the, the pyramid, you know, and then falling back down, when right. she was talking about going back down to earth, which would be, you know, the root, uh, right. that's, that's not a failure because you have to ground yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's more like, um, using all of the, the correspondences and staying balanced in your life, you know, and, and oh, making a pyramid, a firm foundation, then you can go exactly. up to that tip you know at certain points in your life you'll be right up there at that tip but don't forget your foundation 
Exactly. Foundation is, is key. And in my opinion, should I say, the more not, I, I figure that your magic is like your muscles. You go to the gym and work them out. And so yes. to, to learn as much as you can about different practices, if only because you want to educate yourself, may not necessarily put it into practice, but it's good to have these because sometimes you never know these, these ceremonial uh, based magic, you read something and think, wow, I can actually add it to my craft and it may enhance and you pick, you kind of work with what you got. And I feel that you, you adapt your magic to yourself. It's your own personal craft, as you say. So if someone were to use, say, a lot of this ceremonial stuff and they would like to incorporate that as above, so below, that's perfectly okay, as well as someone who is crafting it in their own particular way, you know, as above, so below, in a less ceremonial base. Both are good. And if I may interject with the uh, birch the tree uh, take on all this, <laughs> in tree magic, you get it both ways. Neither the leaf nor the root can survive without the other. Exactly. The roots are what draw up nourishment from the earth and the leaves are what draw rely on both. The energy and so I see like the what they would call high magic as sort of your branch and leaf. Lower magic is the root. It's earth-based. Yeah. But the entire tree survives because it has both. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to say this too about like I come from farmers and, and horse folk and whatnot. And there is a certain element of like planting by the moon and mm -hmm. you know, looking at different things like that. So even within mm -hmm. just regular farming, you have folk magic practice and these beliefs in planting certain times a year by certain moons by certain things and that just brings it kind of sort of all together again you know you're looking up to consider what you're doing below you know yeah no mm -hmm. i remember when i was in north carolina and I moved there just right to catch the harvest moon all the farmers were like harvesting under moonlight and practicing and then they're having a big bonfire and they're actually contributing i saw this as an anime they're actually contributing to holo the, the wolf of wheat and several other like gods of growth and i'm, and I'm like i thought you guys are christians and they were and then they because i went to an event there was like all kinds of food there was fresh apples it was amazing how they still celebrated this you know and, still yeah as for very practical reasons, if you got to get the harvest in before the frost sets in, you don't have a whole lot of time. So you wait for the full moon because that's when you're going to have enough light to harvest your crops. Yep. You can't do it under a new moon. It's too dark. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And, and where I come from, frost is a big deal for farmers. Exactly. Yeah. It, it would be the one of the main differences between the, the high or ceremonial magic versus the low or folk magic would be the, the the high magic would be very much done under certain conditions under certain ceremonially based environments whereas the folk magic you're you're down in the trenches you are doing things with the the, the crops and it's very much it's, it's pragmatic yes yeah Well, I just was looking up in uh, Google here, <laughs> and there is an old Lakota Indian saying, as above, so below, and that they believed that the heavens were a mirror for the earth, and what happens up there will happen down there in some shape or form. Um, they also uh, talk about the Navajo and, the, and how they use the stars um, as more than just a calendar. 
uh, it has the same type of thing. Stars aren't the only thing you see in the night sky. You can see a lot of other different things, meteors, comets, and different tribes had different explanations for what they were. And some thought that meteors were omens of sickness or death. And others believed that spirits were on their way to the afterlife. So it's interesting, another way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's important to, to understand that people new to occultism, but speaking mostly about the craft at this point, it's important, uh, and I tell new people all the time, because it's very, yes, it's important to get the fundamentals and the foundation correct. You want to know, you want to know the basics. However, I come across that they, they would want to do things so what they would call right or correct to do things in a particular sense that they, they, they forget that their own tools, their own self is primary to their craft. And it's like, oh, they read books, they get spells. I'm like, yeah, you can get spells, you can get herbs, you can get all these things. Yes, those will work. You get the foundation, but don't forget that you are bringing something to it yourself. And you have your foundation, which is just as wonderful, which is just as beautiful as any of those books you're reading. Mm -hmm. Question, does this Kabbalion have any resource back to the Kabbal? Yes, uh, they- the Jewish uh, religion? They, they use this same kind of um, information. Mm-hmm. You know, spiritual paths, in my opinion, they are like, like rivers. They all flow into the ocean, following their own path. I guess I, I really am at the UU Church for a good reason. <laughs> you look and you will find similarities in different cultures, in different uh, religions. Absolutely. Yeah, truth is truth. <laughs> How about we end the evening with um, a meditation together? Perfect. Take a moment to think of a situation or a relationship that you would like to improve. And as you do that, relax in your chair and take a deep breath in. And breathe out. And let's breathe together again. and breathe out. And as you do it, let whatever you want to work on be become more clear in your mind. What is it you would like to improve tonight? One more time together, breathe in. and breathe out. And as you do, close your eyes and see yourselves in a high place, surrounded by sunlight. It's a beautiful morning somewhere very, very high up and you are in a place where you are surrounded by the light and love of the Almighty whether that be your goddess or your God. It is a place where you are happy and there is no room for anything but positive feelings and experiences. It is a place where there's only room for light and love. And as you are sitting in that high place, you turn your eyes down towards earth and 
you see yourself with the person or in the situation that you are trying to improve. And it is upsetting. And as your energy was so high up in that high place, it brings you down. Don't be, uh, don't despair. Reach inside your heart into your own light and trust that you can go back up there to that high place again. And as you're sitting up there, feel again how you are surrounded by the light and the love and the beauty and it feeds your soul. And up there in that high place, imagine how you would like that relationship or that situation to be. Filled with positive, with high energy. Take a moment and imagine it. As you are in the middle of it, let your breath out and let it stay out there, that energy of, of the great relationship or the great situation. Let it stay out there in the beautiful sunlight and be permeated with it. And now look down again on where it is now and see how you can bring it higher up. See how you can raise the vibration. See how you can put more love, compassion and understanding in that situation. See how you can increase the love and understanding with that person and bring it higher, closer to what you visualized to be the perfect situation, the perfect relationship. Bring it higher, as high as you can. Do not be upset if you cannot bring it as high as you are feeling when it all starts. It's all right. This is an exercise that you are supposed to repeat whenever you have time. Now let go of it and go back into the light and enjoy its embrace and fill your heart with it. It is healing whatever you're trying to fix. So mote it be. And now gently come down to the earth and keep in your heart the beauty of what you experienced. Take some of it with you. And have the knowledge that you put out there in the spirit realm, a positive desire, positive energy, your desire to make something better in your life. And it will happen something great to practice early in the morning with your daily meditation. Thank you. Thank you, Moonlight.
Thank you. Thank you, Moonlight. That was wonderful. Really good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks, Diana. You're very welcome. You're my family and my friends, and I miss you very much. And I really don't miss being in the circle with all of you and 120 other people. <laughs> <laughs>